and good morning everybody hi i'm walter and i'm the dutch mentor this is another session of our chat with leadership or about leadership uh, today my guest is jeff roach uh, and, and jeff and i not only match haircuts uh, but we also have a bit of a matching career path in the sense that we made some you know changes along the way uh, and i think that's the story that we want to share today but before we get started uh, Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, where you came from out of college, uh, your, about your journey, and then we can dive a little deeper into those transition questions. Good morning, Absolutely. and thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And yeah, so obviously, uh, Jeffrey Roach, I, I go by uh, my mantra on LinkedIn, people know is, is son of a nurse, uh, started my career, um, you know, in hospital administration. But to your point, my mother is a nurse. So I actually what most people don't realize is I studied political science in college. I uh, thought I was going to go the political route. Uh, do still do a lot of activities around that um, and actually did start, you know, earlier in my career, uh, some of that work, even before I came into uh, into college. Um, but after college, it was really I had an academic semester in a hospital system. And, you know, obviously grew up with a nurse, uh, you know, heard all about the role of, of what nurses do in hospital systems and knew that I didn't want to be clinical. But I had this semester long internship in what was an integrated marketing business development, uh, government affairs department of a large uh, healthcare system in the Lehigh Valley. And so after that, I just fell in love. I saw all the opportunities that one could have, you know, from a non-clinical perspective. I landed my first job at Pocono Health System, now part of Lehigh Valley Health Network, uh, as the community relations coordinator, which really was, as you can imagine, the eyes and ears of the healthcare system in the community, building those relationships, partnerships, uh, to really foster, you know, our mission, vision, and values as a healthcare system, it was a job that I truly loved because it, it really meant I was representing the hospital at the chamber, at the university, in K through 12, among businesses, employers, you name it. Um, I quickly moved into leadership, and what's interesting is that I always loved leadership. Uh, even as a college student, I was a leadership graduate. Uh, I did a lot of leadership uh, tr seminars, training, certifications. Um, and always had that as a burning desire, but it was really my CEO who saw that in me and, and quickly said to me, um, you know, hey, you have an interest in government affairs. I want you to build the program for us. Uh, you have an interest in strategy. I want, I want you to learn, you know, from us how you can be a part of that. And so what I didn't realize was she was putting me on a path. She moved me to report to our director of planning. And uh, within a couple of weeks of reporting to him, he said to me, well, I'm going to be retiring. Uh, and, you know, in just a couple of years. Uh, and so uh, just so you know, you're on a path. I'm going to mentor you, grow you, and, and you're going to be on a path to succeed me. Um, what he didn't what he didn't really mean was he was retiring sooner than later, actually. Um, he, re he retired pretty soon uh, after that. And uh, they moved me into the director role. And I then had, you know, was director of strategy, business development, uh, all of our work in the community, uh, everything except for marketing from an external affairs perspective. And then I just continued to grow, you know, other members of the team that I was that were reporting to me, other departments. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I was the youngest leader at the time in the organization, um, but it was truly a labor of love. Uh, phenomenal experience, a lot of mentorship. I was blessed when I hear the stories today, and I know you do such important work in this space. I was truly blessed to have not just one, but multiple mentors at the executive level that truly took me under their wing and truly invested in me in, in ways that I can't even imagine, uh, you know, was possible to be honest. Um, everything from conferences to programs, uh, they were the ones that said to me, go get your master's and we'll help pay for it. Uh, they were the ones that, you know, took me to, to activities that normally you wouldn't get to go to, but I got to go to really as kind of a right hand of the CEO. And it was just an unbelievable experience. It is um, just I know that there's a story after, but let's stop here for a second, because I think it's really, really important to highlight. So as we talk to to our mentees today, right, and is that the the ownership needs to be, you know, with the mentee is that if you didn't put yourself into the position, uh, those senior level people were likely not going to match your energy. Right. So it's really what you bring to the table. And I cannot overemphasize enough using the IDP, uh, you know, the individual development plan. Uh, approach of 70 2010 you, you're talking about it right it's 70 percent on the job learning in your current role and then continuously expanding don't wait for it to come to you offer services put yourself out there create that network 20 percent is about having that mentor and yeah, i've been very very fortunate 
that I've been mentored by some two phenomenal people and of course many more uh, indirectly over time, but it, they didn't come to me, I went to them. I, I, you know, I made it a point that they wanted to work with me because I showed them energy and interest and it's very similar to what you bring to the table. And then of course that 10% is that formal learning, going back and making sure you have, you have the proper degree. Those things prop you up for success and it accelerates the success rate. And I'm, I'm seeing it too often that the people are kind of being laissez-faire about it, right? They come in and they think I'm doing a really good job in the current role. Why am I not getting the promotion? So talk a little bit about that when you finally got to that position that you, uh, you, you've been there, done that two or three times. And now you said, listen, what is next? And sometimes you have to make that critical decision of going outside of the organization. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, what's interesting for me is, as you know, from a prior discussion, you know, I was there for just under 10 years and um, that was the longest place I've ever been employed. And it was the best work environment I ever had the privilege to serve in. The best of the friends that I have in life ha came from that experience. The best colleagues that I had came from that experience. Now for me, I honestly would be there today if, if it wasn't for, you know, an acquisition. Uh, that, that literally overnight changed things, you know, very quickly. And, and many of us have been through this and, and um, you learn a lot. I mean, you certainly learn a lot. From a personal end, it, it really hits you. Um, and I didn't realize for a while, actually, how impactful it was to me because so much of my DNA, so much of my passion was in that job. Um, and there was a lot that I learned after that, um, particularly, you know, around me, right? I've got I've to think more about Jeffrey then I have to think about my employer uh, because there was so much that I invested in that job that when it when that happened, um, it was just a, a huge hit. And so um, following that experience, honestly, because I was so, you know, kind of not in a great place, I said, you know what, I'm done with hospitals. Uh, I'm done with hospitals. And, um, you know, actually came into academia, uh, you know, landed an executive level job at a college. Uh, doing strategy, doing a lot of the similar things I did, exact same things I did in, a, in the hospital system, but in the higher ed setting. And there were a couple of reasons. One, as you know, in the in the area I was in, mergers and acquisitions was all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in where I lived and where I served, there were only two big shops at that time. One that acquired my hospital and the other competitor. The competitor was just interested in me telling them all that they could. And I, I wasn't interested in that because uh, obviously I had a severance and I also had integrity. Um, and so I wasn't interested in, in spilling the beans because that's just not what you do in, in the professional environment. And and so I made that decision. And honestly, it was a good decision because it was also a good opportunity for me to really grow my bona fide uh, expertise uh, in these areas that I did in healthcare, also in higher ed. Because as you know, in my opinion, there are, there are two industries that can really transform communities and it's eds and meds. And yep. so uh, that was a conscious decision. To your point, though, it was a decision that I made still with mentorship, uh, still with support from others that said to me, you know what, go try it. No, no hurt in trying it. Um, I will tell you that to this day, and, and people that have worked with me know this, I have not found the same level of passion in the work that I do compared to that first position, uh, compared to those 10 years uh, with Pocono. And the reason I say that is it wasn't a job. Every day was so mission. It didn't even feel like I was working. I had the best team in the world. I had the best leaders in the world. And what's sad for me is that to this day, many, many years later now, uh, I left obviously in 2017, so not that many, but from 2017 to this day, I've never experienced any leadership uh, like I did there, any true authentic leadership. Uh, that truly cared about people in the way. And, and I, I hope and aspire uh, that when I reach that level, um, that I can certainly bring that type of spirit back because I truly believe it's so critical uh, more than ever today. Yeah, and I think there's really two key takeaways for, for the audience on that is A, uh, don't take anything for granted, right? It is be prepared for the unknown. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we get really comfortable and we're in an organization for 10 years uh, for me, listen, Nyack Hospital, which was from a local community hospital, I loved being there because I knew the community members. I knew it was having a direct impact on patient care and, and policy procedure and all the other things, you know, even being heavily engaged in building out the, the, the future plan. 
when you leave that and all of a sudden something happens like a merger acquisition or a layoff or sometimes new leadership comes up and they want to start with a clean slate while you're in the role you have to think about that right so the mentorship is in key but your your network and starting to think beyond what you know what your current role is uh, and you need to be mentally prepared for that but also financially prepared for that yeah. too often we live paycheck to paycheck and, and, and we, we spend on things that are, you know, we shouldn't be spending money on. We should be really thinking about how can I have six months of money in the bank just in case something happens. Um, and you listen, it, to get to six months in the bank is hard to do, but $100 every week um, that is more likely affordable accumulates over time to having enough money that when you go into that transition period that you have some financial security for your family. And then, of course, it's about how can you think bigger than your current role? How can I expand beyond the box that I have been in for a long period of time? So going to academia certainly was a noble thing to do. And and I think the second key thing is that when when you work with phenomenal leaders, and I had the opportunity to work with, or actually meet a phenomenal leader early in the week, mm. is that you have to think about that is that, you know, my role today is to create those types of leaders. That's where my passion is. That, you and I have seen the gap between great and good and mediocre, and mm -hmm. there are very few great leaders out there. Yep. And I think it is not for me to work with the executive team on making them great, that it's almost too late. It is a, you know, the emerging leader, that aspiring leader on the manager director level that can still be shaped into become that highly servant leader who can be outward looking, who have high mo emotional intelligence and has the drive to mentor, coach the next generation up, and then of course, pay it forward. So I know that after the academia, you had to make another critical decision for yourself. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just say that uh, it was during, to your exact point earlier, it was during that transition and during my time in academia, where one of my mentors said to me, Jeffrey, the best thing you could do is to, is to really look at other ways, not just to grow your revenue, but grow your impact. And so that's when I also started to get engaged in the startup community and started to advise startups that were coming into healthcare, um, started to get engaged in, you know, other consultant type activity, uh, which has been a true blessing uh, in, in a number of ways, because to your exact point, um, you, you learn that it can't just be about the one job. You learn that if you want to have impact, you've got to be thinking, you know, to your exact point beyond that job. So um, after my time in academia, uh, I was recruited uh, to, um, so I served at two different colleges um, and, uh, you know, directly, you know, the first, as I said, I was applied, search, you know, search committee got hired. The second was, it was handpicked by the president to join his, his cabinet uh, to lead uh, healthcare strategy and partnerships, both domestically and globally, which was a fascinating opportunity. As a result of that work, I was, uh, you know, it was really during that time that I started to really build my personal brand out. Uh, what did I offer uniquely, having served in both eds and meds? And uh, I got a call, uh, several calls, you know, by by leaders uh, of then what was called Dignity Health Global Education, which is a, a, a ed tech startup that is actually uh, owned by Common Spirit Health, the largest and one of the largest healthcare systems in the country. And um, obviously, I had never worked in a startup. Uh, yes, it's invested in by Common Spirit, but it is still a startup, and so um, there's always risk associated with that. But um, I weighed it, you know, to your earlier point, right? I weighed the risk. And what I looked at it was like, I'm going to get exposed to these executives at Common Spirit. Uh, I'm going to have the opportunity to do global level work. Uh, the COO of Common Spirit had funded what was called an equity impact scholarship that essentially looked at how could we impact the globe with education and drop the cost of education in a way that would reach people all throughout the world. That risk ended up being a phenomenal reward. Um, even though I was there for, for just just about a year, um, and, and then, you know, like a lot of startup experiences, you, you it's just the startup world, uh, you know, did move on. Um, and I will say there was a lot of interesting leadership, uh, you know, leadership aspects of why as well, um, without question. But what I learned there was profound. So much of the work I do today, so many of the relationships that I have today, some of the best friends um, that I have in the world have come through that experience um, because I got to know them. I got to work with them globally, internationally. Um, and, you know, now when they're thinking of doing stuff in the United States, they're calling on me and we're thinking about it. So to your earlier point, that network, if there's one thing that I could ever impart with an emerging leader, um, and I just had this conversation yesterday with high school students, 
uh, ironically, is there's no better job than healthcare. Absolute no better job. You will never get more fulfillment in any other job than serving in healthcare, whether clinical or non-clinical, because you see the impact, you see the difference every day. Yep. But you've got to build your personal brand. You've got to build what the world sees as the unique Jeffrey or the unique Sally or whatever, you know, whatever it is, because healthcare is such a people focused or it should be, but, but it's also such a, um, such a type of culture where there's going to be a lot of other people who want to get ahead of you. Uh, and that's like that in other industries, but when you build your personal brand and you make sure that everyone knows it, you build that network. And what I have learned is that it's not a matter of applying for jobs. Uh, it's really going to come through your network. Yep. Uh, and everything since since even that time for me has come through my network wasn't the normal you know got to go through this and so that's what i would impart is build your network build your brand and make sure your network knows what's unique about you and and sell it be comfortable don't be too humble that's the thing i, I was failing at earlier in my career is don't be too humble be, be authentic be a connector but absolutely sell who you are yeah, I just uh, too many people lead from insecurity, uh, right, and self doubt, and then it is something that comes with experience. Uh, but yeah, to, right to your point is that um, I started a campaign uh, last week about get your story straight. And it's people, what do you talk about get your story straight? So it is sad to see that all the people we've talked to, and when you ask them, so why do you do what you do? They can't come up with a story. And so you're going into an interview, the most likely going to face the first question, networking, interviewing, all the same to me. The first question is, tell me a little bit about yourself. And people tell a generic, you know, prepared or unprepared, or they ramble on for three to five minutes, and you're just one of many. It is your opportunity to spend some time thinking about your why. Get the hook, tell a short 30, 40 second story. It's about your personal brand. What is your differentiating strength? And that's where confidence comes from. And that's where you can become that outstanding, that after they have talked and spoken to 20 people, they say, hey, I remember that Jeffrey, he had a real, his story was, you know, stuck with me. And that is the thing that people need to really grasp to today. It is about the network. It's about storytelling. It's about making making an impact. And I 100% agree with you that healthcare uh, is an extremely rewarding profession to be in. And remember that healthcare is not just at the bedside. There is a wide world of uh, around uh, healthcare itself that it, that you can have in, you know, direct and indirect impact. So as you know, I, as a paramedic, as a fly paramedic, I love taking care of patients. Today, I can no longer do that. But I know that by working with leaders who take care of, you know, more junior people or frontline people who can positively impact patients, I'm still impacting patient care. Yep. And that, that's what, really what it is about. So the last step, so tell us a little bit about the role that you're currently in and what it is that you see yourself doing in, in the future. How do you b continue to build out that big uh, dream that you have? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, last spring I was recruited into inaugural role here at Siemens Health and Ears, which is a you know first time and and you know kudos to Siemens for having a role like this. They're the first in the med tech space actually to even have a role uh, like this within North America, which is to really build out how does Siemens Health and Ears help hospitals and health systems think about their next generation of workforce. Um, and so uh, you know it's really thinking about K through 12 through higher ed. Uh, through the workforce system, government, community-based organizations, and how do we really build that next generation workforce? And obviously we're very interested in the imaging space because technologists are really critical uh, within, within the critical role within healthcare. And oftentimes people don't think about the role that they have. They think it's the radiologist doing all the work, but it's the technologist who do the scans and it's the radiologist yep. who reads it, right? And so we're starting there. Um, you know, Naga role, so a lot of building, a lot of strategizing and a lot of, um, you know, thinking about and, and, and giving thought to what this should look like. But, but the key is it's about the workforce of the future and the future of work, which as you know, in healthcare has just been uh, totally uh, turned upside down. Uh, not, not because of COVID, which I know a lot of people wanna go right to COVID. COVID added to it, but the reality yeah. of it is, is it's been for a while. Technology What's changes so rapidly, right? And, and therefore people need to change with it. Absolutely, absolutely. And we need to be more agile and adaptable uh, in yeah. healthcare because we both know uh, you, especially from being a clin you know, on the clinical end, we, we move a little slow at times yeah. um, and it's hurting us now. You know, what's next for me is, look, I um, there is no doubt. Um, and, and most people will say this to me. If there's anything that I'm passionate about, it is it is the aspects of leadership. And um, 
I can't say I know exactly what role, right? Um, my former CEO used to say, I want you to be a CEO. And there was a lot of times where I really thought about that. There's also a piece of me that, that feels very strongly about the higher ed sector as well, because um, having been in both, I think that higher ed needs to do a better job of meeting industry needs as well. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I've had that experience, but, but it's definitely going to be in, a, in an executive level because I've really learned through my career now of 15 years, uh, still young, uh, still learning every day, which is also an important lesson for our emerging leaders. Learn every day, never stop learning. That if I'm going to really be in a position to impact and influence, I'm going to have to get to that level because I've realized that. Um, you know, even when you're in middle management, even when you get to upper middle management, even having been at the executive level at a college, but smaller organization that you've got to you've got to be in a true position of influence to really make that make that movement. Um, and if I can have impact and legacy, it's going to definitely be on the leadership side, um, just because to your exact point and you're doing this work so critically, it just saddens me when I see some of the leadership qualities that we're seeing in organizations today. And if I can be a beacon of hope to change that, I, I feel I have to call, be called to do it. Yeah, I, thank you for sharing that. I, I, again, to me, it is, you have to have that big dream, even though that dream can shift itself. I, we don't need to go chiseled into stone and say, listen, this is what I wanna be. You can move it around, but having being an influencer and having an impact uh, and, and, and part of your legacy, I think that is a dream come true for most of us but it has to be connected to small actions every day. And that's where, you know, it's a, we talked first about you know, the heightened self-awareness, that personal brand, your strengths, your IDP, all the work that goes into that. And then it needs to be supported by that, that really disciplined, continuous improvement of self before you even can think about, you know, starting solving problems at root causes or how to operationalize a team uh, that is highly effective and, and can accelerate performance. So Jeffrey, th thank you for sharing your story today. It is, uh, you know, it's something it, it is inspiring. You, you know, obviously, you you well spoken, and I have no doubt that you will go wherever you uh, want to go. Uh, never forget that work-life balance, taking care of your kids, as we spoke about that off camera for a few minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, my 15-year-old son asked me to get his uh, get his jogging pants uh, because you, you know it made it, it's better if I do it than he does it himself. Or for you to take care of the kids before you go off to work. Listen, cherish those moments because those moments will fly by. And before you know it, uh, you know, you, you, you scratch your head and say, listen, I missed out on something. So it's really, really important to have always that balance. I, you know, I'll leave it with saying, listen, it's mental wellness, spiritual wellness, physical wellness, relationship wellness, and financial wellness is the foundation of you. Any of these pillars are cr crumbling, the house of cards will collapse. Um, any parting words for, for the uh, audience? All I would say is, is, you know, really follow your dreams, develop that personal brand and soar to new heights because it is absolutely possible for everybody if you do it. Um, and definitely think about mentoring and to your point, if you are a mentee, do your part. Um, I know that it's made all the difference in the world for me all the time. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I look forward to having a conversation uh, at your next stage of the game. Thank you. We'll talk soon again. Thank you. Uh -huh.